So uh, I've already got an introduction, so hi. Uh, my name's Debo, that's my nickname. I go by it often. Uh, I'm a tech lead at Wave. Many of our engineers are here today at PyCon Canada. In fact, most of them are sitting in that row. Thanks, guys. And uh, I was also the past chair of PyCon Canada 2013, and I was the sponsorship lead in 2012. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about a book I'm working on called 500 Lines or Less. That's the fourth book in the architecture of open source applications book series. What is that? Um, it's a book series that was founded by Greg Wilson, who also founded Software Carpentry. Does anybody recognize that name? Yep. And uh, Amy Brown, uh, quite a few years ago. Their idea when they founded the series was that uh, an architect of the building type will often study thousands of buildings throughout their career. And more importantly, they'll read critiques of those buildings uh, throughout their career. And the idea was to get this sort of level of um, learning about, software, about criticism and bringing it into the software industry. So the first two volumes were very much uh, free-form write-ups of pretty popular open source projects, uh, generally by the current maintainer of that project. Um, so those authors were encouraged to write about you know, the history, the evolution of the project, uh, and the high-level architecture, obviously. But really what ended up happening is they just wrote about whatever they wanted. Um, usually whatever caused them the most trauma, I think, going back to read those uh, chapters. But uh, by and large, it wasn't something that had really been done much before, and a lot of people got a lot of useful lessons out of it. Uh, here are some of my favorite projects from the first two volumes. You may recognize some of them. Um, the GHC one is probably my favorite chapter because Simon Peyton Jones is hilarious when he writes. I think it's because he's British. Um, but one of the comments we got, and I say we loosely because I wasn't around at this point, um, but the first couple of volumes were pretty broad in their scope, and it didn't feel like you could compare the chapters to one another. So in the third book, we tried to focus a bit more on a single vertical. A lot of programmers worry about performance. And so we wrote, uh, we edited a volume on performance. Uh, that was actually edited and produced by a person who was an undergrad at the time, uh, Tavish Armstrong. And he also built the whole tool chain upon which we now build the book. So he did a great job. Um, those are the first three volumes. And those are the only ones that are available uh, online right now for you to purchase and read. Um, some numbers. So AOSABook.org uh, gets about 17,000 uniques a month. We've sold over 10,000 copies across all three books. And because all the proceeds go to Amnesty International, we've raised over 60K for Amnesty International. So again, I say we. I was not around for any of this, but I am now sort of taking credit for it. So thanks, Greg. <laughs> um, so now the book that we're actually working on, 500 lines or less. Uh, I know that grammatically, it should be 500 lines or fewer. We've had many people tweet at us that, that this is the case. We knew going into this, but I also like alliteration. Um, one of my teammates uh, made the crack that when we release the book, what we should actually do is arbitrarily send somebody the first 500 lines of the manuscript or the source code to less when we actually ship the book. I've decided not to do that. Um, so why did we write this book? So the scope of the existing books was a bit of a bridge too far for our target audience, which is you know engineers in the first few years of their career, no matter where they've come from. So if your comfort level is working on a system that's like 1,000 to 10,000 source lines of code, reading the source code or reading the architecture history of the GHC compiler is probably a bridge too far for you. Um, so we were hoping to present them with some of the, like, the low to medium level design decisions that a programmer will make in their everyday career when they're working on a project that sort of represents their everyday life. Um, so if you're showing a, an example of like a small compiler or a small text editor or a small web server, what are the decisions you're making in terms of the design? What are the low level coding decisions you're making? And what from your past experience are you bringing with you when you work on this project? So a couple years later, we started this in 2013, um, right after I finished working on PyCon Canada 2013. My wife was thrilled. Um, so we've now completed 20 chapters. We're releasing about one a week. We released our ninth one just this past week. And you can follow along with our progress at the links listed there. They're also at the end of the slides. Um, so here are some sample projects that have been released as chapters, most of them so far. Dan, who actually just spoke right before this, I didn't know he was speaking here today, but he wrote a chapter for the book. Thank you, Dan. Um, and these are just sort of a, a sampling of the kinds of projects that we've been working on in this book. So the process to get a chapter into this book was fairly rigorous. Uh, you wrote the code, there was a code review step, and then you wrote your chapter, and then there was a technical review of your chapter. Each review process was done by at least one relatively new programmer, and then at least one relatively experienced programmer, hopefully somebody who knew a bit about the domain that you were working in. Um, this actually meant that we had about 30, I mean, programmers aren't super great at finishing things, let's be honest. So we had about 30 people show up and say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and write a chapter. Everyone got really far, but real life happens and it's hard to finish sometimes. So we did about uh, at least 60 code reviews, uh, at least 40 chapter reviews, and I had the distinct pleasure of reading all of them. 
So I want you guys to be able to leave this room today, not just knowing about the book, but hopefully with some kind of lesson that I learned throughout this. I learned a bunch, but the best one that I thought could fit in, I don't know, about three minutes that I have left is about clean code. So how many of us here in this room would say day to day that we put some effort into writing clean code? Good. I think that's literally all of you. So if I asked any one of you, could you precisely define what that means for me in like maybe three sentences? How many of you feel confident that you could do that? Wow, that's even worse than I thought. <laughs> okay, damn. So I got into this a lot, when it, especially when it got to the code review time, because everybody was coming in with their own impressions of clean code when they were reviewing these chapters. And what I noticed was that their discomfort with the system when they landed in this code was sort of proportional to how much it differ differed from what they expected to see when they got in there in terms of the bones of that project. So for example, if you're somebody with a computer graphics background, you're probably expecting, if you're reading the source code to a 3D game of some kind, to look like you know there's a scene graph in there somewhere. There's probably something that's streaming events from the client to the server. There's probably something that uh, organizes my screen so that I can render different screens at different times. And if I don't see that, I wonder why not, and I feel lost. And what I also found is when you pressed people for their opinions on these things, you know, depending on how much they've actually researched the history of these patterns that they'd learned about, um, they may have like a more visceral reaction to the seeing stuff that they don't recognize, or they may have a more studied reaction to the things they don't recognize. And the studied ones often generated better feedback because it wasn't as personal. So what I learned a lot in working on this book was the idea of the audience of your code. And often, like I find myself thinking about users a lot, obviously. Um, but you know, what I learned about 500 Lines is that our audience was actually a terrible audience to write for in the sense that it's very difficult to write for somebody who is under the umbrella of a relatively new programmer who doesn't know your domain. But in my real life projects that I work on every day, I feel like we can do a lot better than that. Oftentimes, you know the kinds of people that may be working on your team in the next year, in the next year and a half. Uh, you know the domain you're sort of working in. You're probably familiar with the sort of patterns that people use in that domain. And so maybe we should consider those going in. And so what I've learned from this is to focus more in my everyday life on recognizable architecture rather than on clean code. Um, I say recognizable because I feel like that relatively equates to good in the sense that anybody who shows up in a familiar, comfortable place won't uh, viscer viscerally react to the code quality if they feel like they recognize what's going on within your project. So now I try to think hard about the probable reader of my projects when I go to work on them. So that's all I have for today. Um, I'd like to thank our financial sponsor for this book, PagerDuty. Uh, they pitched in when we didn't have a sponsor, and I don't think we would have been able to finish this book at all without their help. And I'd very much like to thank Wave for their patience while I've been working on this, their support while I've been working on this. Um, pretty much everybody at work, I think, has read a chapter at this point, and uh, for paying my way to this conference as well. So thanks very much.